I, uh, I apologize for being so abrupt to get us started, but Senator Feingold has a leadership meeting that begins at 8.45, and we do want to hear him. So I want to quickly get going into this, and I want to say uh, thank you to all of you for coming. I'm, I'm delighted to have you here. This is, a, this is a conference on a subject that frankly does not get the attention that it needs and deserves in Washington. Uh, you know, we, for being such a sophisticated and big country, we were kind of a one-trick pony country. You know, we could only handle one thing at a time, and, and uh, we, it's pretty tough to bring focus to a topic like Somalia. So it's, it's really very, I'm very grateful that you're here, and I especially want to say thanks to Senator Feingold for getting us started today. Now, Jennifer Cook is going to be leading the discussion, but I did want to say a word of welcome to all of you and a word of welcome to uh, Senator Feinstein. Uh, we, this, this, uh, Feingold, excuse me, Feingold. God, boy, is it? Oh, Feingold. I mean, I just, wow, how bad can I be? Uh, I asked Senator Feingold, uh, you know, when did he first become interested in Somalia? And the, everybody, the staff laughed because evidently this is a... He, and he told me it was an interesting story. When he was elected in uh, 1993, um, he, he, he put a, a sign on his garage door, basically the contract that he signed with the citizens of Wisconsin, and uh, and he was going to invite neighbors to come up and, and sign it and... Uh, and first question he got was, well, what do you think about Somalia? <laughs> you wouldn't think that would happen in Wisconsin, okay? But I think it's typical of uh, this leader, this intellect, that he would be stimulated by something like that to pick up and look at a cause that, frankly, most politicians would just simply brush off. Just brush off, because how, how many votes in Wisconsin are going to hinge on his expertise on Somalia? None. I mean, but he chose instead to dig into a topic that, as he said, is esoteric and, uh, and make a difference, an, an enormous difference in leading the country to think about it. Now, while, while we were waiting in advance, uh, Ambassador Uld Abdullah, before Senator Feingold came in the room, said to me, he said, you know, we had a chance to meet with Senator Feingold uh, in Djibouti last year, and you have no idea what a major impact it made. To have one of a hundred senators, the leadership in America, come and listen. Listen. You know, Americans go around the world, frankly, spending too much time talking, not enough time listening. My dear departed mother once said, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth, and you ought to listen twice as much as you talk. And uh, sometimes you'd think Americans were born with three mouths and no ears. And we do an awful lot of talking. Instead, Senator Feingold demonstrated the very best in American leadership by going and listening. And of course, at that time, very fortuitously, uh, had a chance to meet with, uh, meet with uh, Sheikh Sharif uh, before the election. Okay, so what we have is uh, a, a unique leader who's had a chance to get out in advance show the very best of America's qualities, and that is wanting to hear what the problems are and then make a difference. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're very fortunate to have this, uh, this leader for us in the Senate, and we're especially grateful to have him here with us this morning. Senator Feingold, thank you for coming. We're delighted to have you here. Let's get to you going, and I know that you're going to be willing to take a few questions if you have it. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Russ Feingold. Thanks, John, very much uh, for the kind welcome, and I appreciate the work that uh, CIS has done over the years to bring together such smart and thoughtful people to assess the many challenges and opportunities facing U.S. policy toward Africa, not just today, but also over the long term. Jennifer Cook and Steve Morrison also thank you for your leadership and vision in this regard. And let me also acknowledge and thank the U.S. Institute of Peace for its important commitment to study conflict prevention and long-term peace building across Africa and the world. I also want to recognize the special representative of the Secretary General, as already mentioned by Mr. Hamri, Ambassador Uld Abdallah, who uh, I understand will be speaking later today and I already had a great conversation with him this morning as well as the 
excellent exchange we had uh, when I was in Djibouti in December. I met with him on my trip to the region this past December and have been long impressed by his tireless work and enduring optimism that positive change in Somalia is possible. In addition, I also want to acknowledge the presence of Ambassador John Yates, the former U.S. Special Envoy for Somalia, for whom I have great respect. Finally, as I look around the room, it is apparent we have incredible expertise and experience here. There are many uh, Somalis and Somali Americans who have family and friends directly affected by the ongoing crisis in Somalia. And although John was right that when I answered that first question about Somalia in my driveway, there were no votes in Wisconsin relating to this, there are now. Uh, there are Somalis who work uh, in northwestern Wisconsin, very, very, of course, just a half hour or so from the Twin Cities. And so we are honored to have members of the Somali community living in our state and, of course, are pleased uh, to get to know them better. There are also many who have spent years working as humanitarians, diplomats, and researchers to help bring lasting peace to the Horn of Africa and Somalia specifically. So I am grateful for your continued work and honored to be with you today. As was said, I've been working on Somalia for a long time. In 1993, as a new U.S. New US senator, even before I was sworn in, it was actually 92, I watched as U.S. troops in Mogadishu tried, with tragic consequences, to restore law and order. I was concerned about how poorly defined the nature of the mission was, and I did support the withdrawal of our troops. But I was also concerned that we would uh, disengage completely uh, politically and that that could come back to haunt us. And, of course, it did. More recently, in 2001 and 2002, at a series of hearings I chaired on security threats posed by weak or failed states in Africa, Somalia kept coming up again and again. I called on the Bush administration then to develop a coordinated, consistent, and long-term approach to Somalia. This never happened. Instead, all the limitations of the last administration's war on terror remained apparent. The manhunt for individual terrorists continued, but without any coherent strategy for stabilizing Somalia or eliminating its status as a terrorist safe haven. When I last spoke here in January 2007, I warned that the situation in Somalia would get much worse if we did not move quickly to develop and implement a comprehensive stabilization and reconstruction strategy. Tragically, again, this is just what happened. The situation is far worse today uh, than it was two years ago. You all know the statistics, so I don't need to repeat them. But I'll cite the words of senior UN officials, including Undersecretary for Humanitarian Affairs John Holmes, who has called it the world's worst humanitarian crisis, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. I think we can all agree that the situation in Somalia has also become worse since 2006 in terms of security and specifically its impact on U.S. national security. While the Somali people are a moderate people, the terrorist group al-Shabaab has grown in ranks and reach. In public statements, al-Qaeda's number two leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, has highlighted this as a success story and repeatedly called for foreign fighters to travel to Somalia. Many of our top national security leaders, including then CIA Director Hayden and Joint Chiefs Chairman Mullen, have recently said that Al-Qaeda is trying to gain new footholds in Somalia. And at her confirmation here, Secretary Clinton also expressed concern that Al-Qaeda is trying to take advantage of the state failure in Somalia. So the threats to our national security continue to be very real. And we need to make sure that they are addressed in the strategy we develop. I am confident that President Obama and his administration are paying attention to these growing threats and the deepening crisis in Somalia. And I was pleased to learn that they are, in fact, now beginning a serious interagency policy review process. Now, this strategy, as I have indicated, could not come at a better time. And that is in part because of the recent opportunities for increased attention and invigorated engagement. First. There was the withdrawal of the Ethiopian forces in January. When I was in Djibouti in December, we weren't sure that was going to happen, but in fact, that has transpired. Second, the election of President Sharif, the appointment of Prime Minister Sharmarki, the naming of the new cabinet, and the attempt